Audio Lecture, 19th Century European Society, Urbanization, and Intellectual Movements between 1800 and 1914. This first section we will deal with is the Second Industrial Revolution and the late 19th century society that goes along with it. Theme. By 1900, much of Europe had become urbanized and industrialized. Key concepts. Key concepts. Key concepts. The second industrial revolution took place between 1870 and 1914. The first industrial revolution that we covered in Unit 7 had occurred between 1780 and 1850. <clears throat> and it involved mostly textiles, coal, iron, and railroads. The second industrial revolution increased the mass production of goods with new technologies, such as steel production. Steel rails were created, larger structures were possible with steel, and also better heavy machinery. The Bessemer process resulted in high quality steel that was produced much more efficiently and far less expensively than before. This was actually covered in your readings from Unit 7, but we're reviewing it here too. Oil was another thing that came out of the second industrial revolution. Kerosene for lighting, as well as the internal combustion engine were now possible in factories. Following the American inventor Thomas Edison's development of a power grid in the late 1870s, England built the first European electric power stations in 1881 due to the internal combustion engine. The steel, textile, shoemaking, and construction industries increasingly used electricity as well for lighting. Electricity increasingly powered large cities. And chemicals were also used in the Second Industrial Revolution. Germany led in photo processing and other areas such as dyes, soaps, and pharmaceuticals. Also, fertilizers and explosives, which will come into play greatly in World War I. By the 1890s, Germany became the most powerful industrial economy in all of Europe. Britain's huge investment in technology early on meant that it was more difficult to shift to new techniques of the second industrial revolution. Germany came to industrialization, industrialization later and was able to utilize state-of-the-art technology as a result. One thing that we have not covered yet politically is the unification of Germany, which we will do in this Unit 8. So when we are referencing Germany at this point, in some cases we're referring to Germany, the United Empire that's created after 1871, but in some cases we're still just referring to the Germanic principalities that were part of the Germ German Confederation. Germany, thus, will lead Europe in the production of organic chemicals and power generators. Relative shares of world manufacturing are shown in these graphs over the years between 1880 and 1913. Key concepts. The expansion of industry and technology created growing demand for experts with specialized knowledge. Science and technology became closely linked as a result. Professional occupations grew or emerged among the bourgeoisie. Occupations like engineering, architecture, chemistry, accounting and surveying, white collar jobs. The management of large public and private institutions also emerged as a profession.
CEOs of companies, in other words. All of these changes helped to expand and diversify the lower middle class. The number of independent property owning shopkeepers and small business people grew as a result of the second industrial revolution. An increase in white collar employees as well. This also will include lower white collar employees like salesmen, bookkeepers, store managers, and clerks. Key concepts. Industrialization continued to attract huge numbers of workers to the cities. By 1900, over half of industrial workers in Britain, Germany, and Belgium worked for companies with more than 20 workers. New technologies and means of communication and transportation resulted in a truly global economic network for the first time. Key concept. Urbanization. Population growth. Britain was the first large country in Europe to experience urban growth. Over 50% of the population in 1891 lived in urban areas. London was by far the largest city in Europe at this time. The European population as a whole increased by about 50% between 1870 and 1914. By 1900, nine European cities had populations of over 1 million people. That's a lot of people in one city, folks. Significant declines in mortality rates also occurred, especially among children. Birth rates actually fell, however, during the period, like in France. And some of this had to do with new birth control methods that were being experimented with. We'll talk more about that with the women's rights movement coming up later on in this unit. Better medical knowledge also, and better nutrition, and better housing were key reasons as well. The number of children per family fell, though this trend was more pronounced in the middle class than anywhere else. Key concept. Poor living conditions during the first half of the 19th century. Parks and open spaces were almost non-existent in the first half of the 19th century when we are referring mostly to the first industrial revolution. Many people lived in extremely overcrowded attics or cellars, as many as 10 people per room. This is review from what we talked about before with the first wave of the industrial revolution in the early 19th century in unit seven. <clears throat> Open drains and sewers flowed along the streets with garbage and human excrement. No public transportation existed. Here is a uh, engraving of Dudley Street, Seven Dials, London by Gustave Doré, showing you the uh, dirty conditions, the poor living conditions um, that people were living in. Here's another showing the squalor of early Victorian England. Key concepts. In, eventually, we will have a public health movement as a result of these poor living conditions and the illnesses that resulted from the bad living conditions. It sought to remedy the high disease and mortality rate that occurred in cities. Up to, up to the middle of the 19th century. Liberalism, in essence, shifted from purely laissez-faire to a kind of interventionist economic and social policy initiative. This was on behalf of the less privileged. The policies were based on a rational approach to reform that address the impact of the Industrial Revolution on the individual. This will also 
lead us into what we will see later on in this unit referred to as mass politics or mass society. As I mentioned before when we talked about socialism, I mentioned that eventually socialism changes politics forever. As more and more people get the vote, the lower classes desire social reforms. So in order to attract their votes, those political parties, whether more conservative or more liberal, have to incorporate social policies in their political platforms to attract those voters. Hence, mass politics and mass society. And socialism becomes part of the growing democracy. Key concept. Edwin Chadwick was the most important reformer of living conditions in cities. He was influenced by Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism that we covered in Unit 7, the greatest good for the greatest number. He saw disease and death as primary causes of poverty. The sanitary idea was the most important. It held disease could be prevented by cleaning up the urban environment. It's amazing that something so simple had never been considered before. Sewage and water systems provided an adequate supply of clean piped water that would carry off excrement of communal outhouses. It cost only 1 20th of removing the waste by hand. Britain, which suffered a cholera epidemic in the early 1830s, passed its first public health law in 1848. Germany, France, and the US also adopted Chadwick's ideas. By the 1860s and 1870s, many European cities had made significant progress in public sanitation using these ideas. Urban redesign and public transportation. Finally, they get the idea that city planning is important. You must plan for future growth. Remember the urban game that we did back in Unit 7 with rapid industrialization and no real adequate planning. They learned their lesson by the second industrial revolution and things will change. France took the lead during the reign of Napoleon III or Emperor Napoleon III, which we'll talk more about him later. Georges von Haussmann redeveloped the city of Paris, redesigned how it would be laid out as they rebuilt certain areas of the city. Wide boulevards were built like the Champs-Élysées, particularly to prevent barricades used in the popular uprisings in France. With those uprisings, like we saw in 1830 and 1848, with the narrow streets, they could be barricaded very easily, uh, and that would stop the flow of business, etc. But with wide boulevards, it's very difficult to put up a barricade that will actually barricade and stop traffic. Better middle class housing was also developed on the outskirts of the city, the suburbs, if you will. And also, we will see a demolition of slums throughout the city of Paris. We also note that Haussmann left room for the creation of parks and open spaces for leisure time that was now part of the industrial era. People, for the first time, had leisure time and so therefore needed places to go and things to do. This is the Opera House in Paris and the surrounding area of Haussmann's design. The main lines created or transformed between 1850 and 1870 in the center of Paris. All of those that are in red were new as part of Haussmann's designs. <laughs> 
Camille Pizarro uh, painted The Avenue of the Opera, 1898, showing you the wide boulevards and how that changes the flow of traffic. A new system of aqueducts was also built in Paris, and it doubled the fresh water supply, as well as 400 miles of underground sewers were built. This was also in response to cholera epidemics in 1832 and 1849 that occurred in Paris. Cities such as Vienna and Cologne followed Paris's lead in its redesign. Key concept, public transportation. By the 1890s, the electric streetcar had revolutionized city transportation. They facilitated the creation of suburbs on the outskirts of cities. Electricity led to the creation of London's subway system in the 1860s, and then Paris's metro in 1900. Both of these systems are still in use today. By 1900, only 9% of Britain's urban population was overcrowded anymore. More than two people per room at this point, rather than 10 people per room. An electric streetcar on a Parisian street. This is a photograph, but the date is unknown. Migration and immigration. Significant migration to cities from the countryside continued, although migrants often maintained connections to their rural areas. Huge numbers of Southern and Eastern Europeans migrated to America's largest cities after 1880 in search of economic opportunity. This led to rapid growth in America's population. Canada and Latin America were also major destinations for these folks. Jews in Eastern Europe fled the persecution of the pogroms or the mass um, massacres that were taking place in places like Russia as well. In some areas, agricultural challenges forced people to search for other opportunities. Key concepts. Concept. Key concept. Changes in the social structure as a result of the Industrial Revolution and urbanization. An increase in the standard of living occurred by the second half of the 19th century due to heightened consumerism. The gap between the wealthy and the working class was still huge, however. This period became the golden age of the middle class. In Britain, wages and consumption increased 50% between 1820 and 1850. Industrial and urban development made society more diverse and less unified. Diversity within the middle class bourgeoisie the bourgeoisie constituted about 15 to 20 percent of the population in Western Europe. Less in Eastern Europe, however, about 2 percent in Russia. Nobles dominated these businesses that were developing there. The upper middle class, like bankers, industrial leaders, large-scale commerce, and top government officials were also coming about. Families tended to employ several servants, even in the bourgeoisie. The diversified middle class, smaller businessmen, professionals, merchants, doctors, lawyers, civil servants. And most of the middle class employed at least one servant as a cook at, or as a maid in the lower middle classes. Lower middle class or petite bourgeoisie were people like independent shopkeepers and small merchants, store managers, minor civil servants, teachers, clerks, and some master craftsmen such as goldsmiths were also part of the petite bourgeoisie. 
the petite bourgeoisie grew from about 7% of the population to about 20% of the population in 1900. Women worked as department store clerks, stenographers, secretaries, waitresses, and nurses. Women held more than half of the post office and government clerical jobs in 1911. Characteristics of the middle class. Some of this is a review from what we've talked about before, so I'm going to go through it kind of quickly. The middle class believed strongly in classical liberalism and sought the protection of their property in constitutional assemblies, like the British Parliament or the French Chamber of Deputies. They gained some political influence through increased land ownership that was now tied to voting rights. This emphasized their individual liberty and respectability based on economic success. The expanding um, of the family's fortune was seen as the clearest means of respectability in the middle class. Families emphasized frugality and planning for the future or investing in the future. They saw the family as the foundation of the social order. Education and religion, especially evangelical Protestantism in England, the Netherlands, and some German states, and Catholicism in France, were seen as extremely important to the middle class family. Strong feelings of nationalism were also part of the middle class structure. Now the working class made up about 80% of the population. Many were peasants and hired hands, especially in Eastern Europe. They were less unified and homogenous than the middle classes, however. Highly skilled workers were at the top of the working class. About 15% of the working class was what we know as the labor aristocracy, the um, highly skilled workers. Construction bosses, foremen, highly skilled craftsmen were all part of this group. The semi-skilled workers, like carpentry, bricklaying, successful factory workers, came next. Unskilled workers and domestic servants, that were mostly women, were at the bottom. By 1900, over half of working women were domestic servants in England. Older children comprised about 14% of workers in British textile factories in 1874. Key concept. The changing family. Romantic love became the most important reason for marriage by 1850. A, compa uh, a companionate marriage became the ideal, much like we think today. The rising standard of living made it possible for people to marry at a younger age. Economic status was still an important issue for the middle class, even after 1850. Middle class females were monitored extremely closely by their parents. Chastity was paramount. Middle class boys were not monitored nearly as much. Fidelity in marriage was particularly emphasized in the middle class. The high rate of illegitimacy among the working class actually decreased after 1850 as well. The high rate of premarital sex remained, but more couples married if the woman became pregnant. Prostitution, middle and upper class men, comprised most of the customers as they tended to marry later than the women did. Key concept. Separate spheres. After about 1850, the work of most wives was increasingly distinct and separate from their husbands. This stood in stark contrast with pre-industrial Europe where farming and cottage industry dominated and husbands and wives worked together. This again is some review of some other things that we've discussed in past units. Husbands became the primary family wage earners in the middle class. Uh, in the mid to late 19th century. 
child rearing was more child centered with the wife dominating the home domain. Key concept. The middle class women began to organize and resist their second class status to their husbands. They demanded access to higher education and professional employment. They sought to repeal the, to the repeal of laws that denied women property ownership as well. Child rearing in middle class families. Lower mortality rates for children resulted in parents becoming more emotionally involved in their children's lives. The high mortality rate in pre-industrial Europe had resulted in mothers becoming indifferent to their children, like hiring wet nurses that we discussed in a previous unit. Now, mothers increasingly breastfed their own children. Married couples decreased the number of children that they had, however, especially in the middle class. They sought to provide more care to their children, so they had fewer of them so they could afford to do so. This trend continued until after World War II. Books on child rearing also increased. Parents were now much more intent on improving the economic and social condition of their children children. Child rearing in working class families. Unlike middle class kids, working class children did not remain economically dependent on their families. Boys and girls went to work when they reached adolescence. Young working class adolescents broke away from the family more easily when emotional ties became oppressive. In the 20th century, middle class youths would follow this pattern. Life in the fin de siècle, which means the end of the century in French. The Belle Opique, about 1895 to 1914, refers to an increased standard of living occurring in all industrial countries. This period would later be remembered after World War I as the Belle Opique, which means kind of the good old days. However, better living occurred much more in Northern Europe, like Britain, France, and Germany, than in Southern or Eastern Europe. People gradually enjoyed higher wages while the price of food declined. In Britain, wages almost doubled between 1850 and 1900. More money came to be spent on clothing, Meat consumption increased significantly, partly due to the advent of refrigerated railroad cars and ice boxes that could transport meat further distances. Increased leisure time resulted in more money being spent as well. People increasingly frequented parks, beaches, museums, theaters, and opera houses. Heightened consumerism was another result of this. Sports attracted increased spectators and participants. Sports clubs grew significantly. Soccer or European football, rugby, bicycle and auto races, track and field were all very popular. A huge bicycle craze swept Western Europe in the 1890s. Increased numbers of women took part in bicycling and sports clubs as well. Women gradually abandoned the more restricted clothing that they wore in the past, like corsets and whalebone skirts, for dresses that allowed more movement. The emerging sports culture mirrored the growth of aggressive nationalism in late 19th century. Some social Darwinists, and we'll talk more about that label later, believed that sports competition confirmed the superiority of certain racial groups. Those racial groups that were more talented at certain sports uh, were sometimes seen as better than the um, ones that could not perform as well. Cafes 
and taverns also enjoyed increased patronage in cities and towns. Department stores grew dramatically in this time period and were fre frequented by the middle class. In Paris, dance halls, concerts, and plays drew thousands of people each week. Advertising became big business as a result. You want to attract people to come to your activities and your businesses during their leisure time. New inventions also marked this era. The telephone, the telegraph, the automobile, the gramophone or record player, the radio, which was invented by Marconi, motion pictures. Education also changed. The state's role in education increased dramatically, leading to the further secularization of society. Education often emphasized loyalty and service to the state, while decreasing the influence of organized religion in education. By 1900 in England, all children, all children five to 12 years of age were required to attend primary school. Education was free or paid for by public taxes. In France, the fairy laws required free primary school for children ages three to 13. This led to a significant increase in literacy. Men had higher rates of literacy than women. Urbanites were more literate than rural folk. Higher literacy rates existed in Northern and Western Europe than existed in Eastern or Southern Europe. By 1900, a 99% literacy rate existed in Germany compared to a 25% literacy rate in Russia. That's a huge difference, folks. Girls had less access to secondary education than boys, although schools for girls grew somewhat. Families had to pay the cost, however. Education was seen as a means to improve economic and marriage prospects for girls. In this section, we're going to discuss the scientific advances of the late 19th century. Key concept. Scientific advances. Scientific ideas and methods enjoyed tremendous popularity and prestige in the public mind after 1850 as we were moving through the second industrial revolution. To many, Science became almost a religion, like positivism, which will be discussed later. People could see how the link between science and technology improved their quality of life, like electricity and better medical care. We're going to start by discussing the bacterial revolution. This would be significant in reducing the mortality rate. Louis Pasteur, from 1822 to 1895, developed the germ theory of disease. He came up with a concept known as pasteurization. The fermentation that was caused by the growth of living organisms and the activity of these organisms could be suppressed by the heating of the beverage, like the bacteria and milk can be cooked out of the milk through pasteurization process to make milk safer for human beings to drink. This new knowledge will help reduce food poisoning. Joseph Lister is another, 1827 to 1912. He developed the antiseptic principle in performing surgeries. This resulted in far fewer people dying from infection resulting from surgeries. He came up with the concept of sanitizing not only one's hands before surgery, but also sanitizing the instruments with which one does surgery. Diseases such as typhoid, typhus, cholera, and yellow fever were now under control due to improved availability of vaccines as well. Dmitry Mendeleev from 1834 to 1897, you may be familiar with from your chemistry class. 
He organized the rules of chemistry by devising the periodic table in 1869. Electromagnetism by Michael Faraday, 1791 to 1867. His basic discoveries on electromagnetism in the 1830s and 40s resulted in the first dynamo, also known as a generator. These sure do come in handy when we who live in Florida have to face a hurricane. Generators could also be applied to the development of electric motors, electric lights, and electric streetcars as we move through the second industrial revolution. Auguste Comte, from 1798 to 1857, is known as the father of sociology, a new science born in the 19th century. He's the one that came up with a concept known as positivism. This was where he believed all intellectual activity progresses through predictable stages. Thus, humans would soon discover the eternal laws of human relations through sociology. Comte believed that social scientists could help regulate society for the benefit of most everyone. Comte became the leader in the religion of science and the desire for rule by experts. As we will see, this will eventually impact other social scientists as we move forward. Key concept. Now we're moving on to Charles Darwin, a very controversial figure in the scientific world from the 19th century. He published a book in 1859 called On the Origin of Species by the Means of Natural Selection. In this, he posited the theory of evolution. He believed all life had gradually evolved from a common ancestral origin in an unending struggle for survival. The species that were the most able to adapt to changes in the environment were the ones he said survived. Now he started off by studying nature. Uh, eventually he will add human beings to this concept and this is where the controversy begins. The impact on religion was that Darwin's theory seemed to refute the literal, the literal interpretation of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Adaptation, however, does seem to be something that um, many religious figures would come to accept, if not evolution, adaptation. Uh, the, the notion that human beings, you know, have adapted to changes in our environment, in our world, um, for example, we no longer need our appendix, but we still have one. Um, we've, uh, we've adapted past needing that since we don't consume raw food like we used to when we were uh, thousands of years ago. Um, also, for example, wisdom teeth. The wisdom teeth were something that we needed at one point. Our jaws had to be larger to uh, make room for those wisdom teeth. And now um, our jaws are no longer that large because we don't have to chew the uh, raw meat any longer. So we don't really need the wisdom teeth any longer. These are just a couple of examples. Darwin's ideas um, about nature, uh, um, about the evolution of species, uh, he believed he could prove through fossil evidence, looking at fossils from like giraffes. He could show that giraffes did not used to have as long of necks as they do now. Um, and the this this made him surmise that the reason why the long necked giraffes are what we have now is that as the trees grew, they were the only ones that could reach the leaves that they eat. So the ones with the shorter necks died off. The ones with the longer necks lived to be able to pass that long neck gene onto their, uh, to their offspring. Anyhow, it is a theory only. It created, however, a crisis in some churches. Thomas Huxley was one of Darwin's biggest supporters. Along with Huxley, we have Herbert Spencer, who came up with the notion of social Darwinism. 
Between 1820 and 1903, social Darwinism worked to apply Darwin's theory to human society, arguing why some classes uh, seem to be dominant over others. This led to the idea of the survival of the fittest. Spencer believed that natural laws dictated why certain people were successful and others were not. This would later be used by imperialists, as we will see, to justify the conquest of weaker peoples. What Herbert Spencer ultimately argued was instead of a genetic variation like the giraffe's long neck that allowed it to adapt, the possession and harnessing of technology by some groups of people, i.e. Europeans, over others that they conquered gave them the right to exploit those others, the survival of the fittest. It would also be used by industrialists within Europe and the West to justify their wealth while so many others struggled to survive, struggled for subsistence. It was a justification of not putting through social reforms in the governments by some. Spencer's ideas were particularly popular among the upper middle class, but as you can see, not only do the ideas smack of racism, but also of classicism. Now we come to the new science of psychology with Sigmund Freud. He's considered one of the three giants of 19th century thought, along with Darwin and Marx. In contrast to the rationalism of the Enlightenment, Freud believed that human beings were largely irrational creatures. He said that the mind was divided into three parts. The subconscious mind, he referred to as the id. He argued this part of the mind was not subject to reason. The conscious parts of the mind were the ego, where one's reason lies, and the superego, where one's morality lies. And the notion that he um, came up with was that the conscious parts of the mind, the ego and the superego, suppressed the id and forced it under the surface into our subconscious mind. So we don't even know what those um, those drives are when our, we are conscious. The only time that the id comes out is through our dreams. The best way I have to explain this might sound a little silly, but I think it'll drive the point home. Okay, so to explain the three parts of the mind or the psyche as it's sometimes called, okay, let's say you are walking down the hallway at school and all of a sudden you have got to pee. I mean, it happens. We all have to pee sometimes, right? So your id would tell you, hey, if you got to pee, pee. Go right now. Just pee right here in the middle of the hallway. But your conscious parts of your mind step in and stop you from doing that. They repress the id. The ego, the reason, comes in and says, you can't just pee here in the hallway. You need to go to a restroom. The superego also chimes in where your moral center is and says, you can't pee just here in the hallway because it is not morally acceptable to do so. Get thee to a restroom. So they repress the id and you go to the restroom to pee. If you think about it, babies when they are born are all id. And as we raise them, we teach them to suppress those, those base drives uh, like potty training, for example. Anyhow, silly examples I know, but they do drive the point home. So there you go. People were not as in control of themselves as many like to believe. As a result, Sigmund Freud argued. Freud also emphasized that sexuality was a key driving force in one's psychological makeup. And that was part of what was suppressed in our id he said repressed sexual desires would lead to psychological problems. 
Freud was the founder of psychoanalysis in order to try to unlock the repressed desires of the id. He believed that his, the hysteria of his patients originated in unhappy early childhood experiences where they had repressed strong feelings. Under hypnosis or through patient's free association of ideas, the patient could be brought to understand his or her unhappiness and learn how to deal with it. He found out about this, he argued, by studying people's dreams, having them relay their dreams to him. He said that everything in a dream had some kind of hidden meaning that needed to be unlocked through psychoanalysis. Another key concept, natural science. Now, like physics, the new physics. Here we go. Max Planck. 1858 to 1947, came up with the notion of quantum mechanics, where subatomic energy is em emitted in uneven little spurts called quanta, not in a steady stream as previously thought. And you never know when one of these quanta of energy is going to spurt and cause something to move through time and space. The laws governing the universe now seemed unpredictable at the atomic level. This notion basically takes the, quote, natural laws of Newton and puts them on their, puts them on their head, kind of, so to speak. Yes, there are natural laws that govern the universe, but they are not always the same or as predictable as we once thought. Sometimes, if you don't know when a quanta is going to hit something, you can't determine for sure what's going to happen in time and space. Thus, this means that matter and energy might be different forms of the same thing. It shook the foundations of 19th century physics that viewed atoms as the stable, indestructible building blocks of matter. This was something that had been originally surmised by the early scientific um, uh, physicists like Newton and underscored by later ones. Now we're not so sure if those atoms are stable because if a quanta hits an atom, it can force it to move in a different direction. In other words, yes, there are natural laws governing the universe, but they are not always predictable. Marie Curie is another person. She and her husband, Pierre Curie, uh, did um, studies with radioactive materials. They discovered the first radioactive element, a new element added to the periodic table called radium in 1910. Unfortunately, their work with radium led to the death of Madame Curie eventually from radiation poisoning but they didn't know that at the time. Now we're moving on to Albert Einstein, probably the superstar of uh, the 20th century when it comes to physics. In 1905, he published his first work on the theory of relativity of time and space, and this will challenge traditional ideas of Newtonian physics, even more so than Planck's did. He theorized that time and space was relative to the viewpoint of the observer, and only the speed of light is the constant for all frames of reference in the universe. In other words, the only natural law that is stable is the speed of light. All the rest are relative depending on where they are located or the viewpoint of the observer. I think the best way I have to explain this in my non-scientific mind is by explaining gravity, okay? If you were to go to the moon and uh, weigh yourself there, because the gravitational pull on the moon is less than it is on the earth, it would seem as if you weighed less on the moon than you do on the earth. You are exactly the same person, but you, because the gravitational pull is different on the moon than it is on the earth, you 
register weighing less. In other words, that gravity is relative to each system. Gravity is different on the moon than it is on the earth. Gravity is still a natural law of the universe. It does not discount that there are natural laws of the universe, but it does argue that those natural laws are relative to each system as well as to the viewpoint of the observer. So again, taking Newtonian physics and turning it on its head, people that thought they knew, you know, the universe to be stable now are not so sure. This theory united um, an apparently infinite universe with the incredibly small, fast-moving subatomic world. The theory of relativity ultimately is summed up in a formula, E equals mc squared, where matter and energy are interchangeable. Even a particle of matter contains enormous levels of potential energy. Ernest Rutherford, 1871 to 1937, split the atom for the first time in 1919. He postulated the structure of the atom with a positively charged nucleus and a negatively charged, uh, negatively charged electrons uh, was a basic understanding of atoms and it could be split to release the energy within it. Ultimately, this will be utilized later on to help develop the first atomic bomb. The impact of new scientific theories on the European mind? Well, Darwinism further challenged the Bible's account of the creation of humans. Freudian psychology undermined the belief that humans were rational beings in control of their emotions. The impact of the new physics is even more vast. It shattered the popular belief that the universe could be easily explained via Newtonian physics. It challenged long-held ideas since Newton that all particles interacted based on gravitational force that was constant and the same throughout the universe. Einstein's theory of relativity now theorized that universal laws were relative instead of constant. They were relative based on the position of the observer. Scientists realized that they knew less about the universe than they had previously thought. Uncertainty of this later fed the pessimism of European society in the wake of World War I. And we'll discuss more about that when we get to World War I. Now we're moving on to the realism and modernism in art and society that reflects this entire time period of the second industrial revolution forward. Key concepts. Realism first. Characteristics. First of all, there was the belief that literature and art should depict life as it really was. It was largely a reaction to the failed revolutions of 1848 and 49 and the subsequent loss of idealism as a result. Realism in literature first. France saw the development of the realist movement first. Henri de Balzac, who lived from 1799 to 1850, wrote the human comedy and this depicts urban society as grasping a moral and brutal characterized by a darwinian struggle for wealth and power he did not have a very high opinion of modern society gustave flaubert 1821 to 1880 wrote madame bovary one of the most famous of all the realist novels and Madame Bovary portrayed the provincial middle-class folks as petty, smug, and hypocritical. Emile Zola was the giant of realist literature. He lived from 1840 to 1902, and he portrayed the seamy, animalistic view of the working-class life. Germinal, 
from 1885 depicts the hard life of young miners in northern France and does not paint a pretty picture. In England, Charles Dickens, who we've talked about before, wrote Hard Times. He lived 1812 to 1870. Hard Times portrays the grim life of workers in industrialized England. George Eliot, Marianne Evans, was a real name, pseudonym or pen name of George Eliot, lived from 1819 to 1880. Examine the ways in which people are shaped by their social class, as well as their own inner strivings, conflicts, and moral choices. A lot of these kinds of novels are very popular in um, English literature classes in college, so you may run across many of these as you move into your college career. Thomas Hardy, 1840 to 1928, wrote Tess of the Dubervilles, which portrayed a woman who was ostracized for having premarital sex. In Russia, probably the most famous realist is Leo Tolstoy, the greatest of Russian novelists. <clears throat> he portrayed a fatalistic view of history, but regarded love, trust, and everyday family ties as life's enduring values. War and Peace, written between 1865 and 69, was his masterpiece, and it was the story of Russian society during the Napoleonic Wars. A famous musical was written about this, a portion of War and Peace, uh, and it was up for Tony Awards back in 2017. It's known as The Great Comet. If any of you have ever heard of it, it might be something you'd like to check out. In Scandinavia, we have Henrik Ibsen, 1828 to 1906, and he is seen as the father of modern drama as a playwright. His plays examine the conditions of life and issues of morality, often which were at odds with the Victorian views of the day. Now, realism in painting. Characteristics. The most important artists of the 19th century and the 20th century created art for, quote, art's sake, much like we do today. This included the Romantic movement as well. Rather than depending on patrons to fund their works, like the church or nobles, artists exercised virtual artistic freedom and hope to make a living by selling their paintings to the public. This is when the concept of the, quote, starving artist came about as well, since they no longer had patrons. France was the center of the art world, as artists sent their greatest works to the Paris Salon to be judged. France dominated the realist art movement. Realist sought to portray life as it really was, not idealized, much like we saw with the writers. Ordinary people became the subject of numerous paintings as a result. Gustave Courbet, 1819 to 1877, is the one who coined the term realism. One of his most famous works is The Stonebreakers from 1849. The painting shows two workers breaking stones. It was, a ground, it was groundbreaking as the subject matter seemed extraordinarily trite to many people, and it was panned in the press at the time. Here is Gustave Courbet's The Stonebreakers from 1849. Regular people doing back-breaking work. <clears throat> Francois Millet, is another one showing the gleaners from 1857. These are regular peasants who are working in the fields, gleaning the fields after the crops have been taken in. And Henri Domer from 1862 painted the third class carriage sh showing a train car that was full of regular people. <clears throat> 
Edgar Degas also painted a lot of regular people. He's most famous for his paintings of ballerinas. <clears throat> but here, in his painting that was done between 1884 and 1886, you see laundresses, regular, lower class, working class people. Edouard Manet, from 1832 to 1883, is a French realist and impressionist painter who bridged both of the movements. He's really considered the first modernist painter as a result. Luncheon on the Grass from 1863 was a painting that shocked audiences by portraying a female nude and two male clothed companions in an everyday park setting. His Olympia, painted in 1863, seemed equally revolting to the Salon, the Paris Salon, for its casual nude portrayal of a prostitute. Here is the first painting. And here is the second. Key concepts. Impressionism, characteristics, <clears throat> probably one of the most famous artistic movements still to this day. <clears throat> it was developed in France and the impact of photography had a large role in helping to form the Impressionist movement. Now that cameras could accurately, accurately capture a subject, artists now moved away from trying to perfectly capture the image of a person or a place. Painters now sought to capture the momentary overall feeling or impression of light falling on a real life scene before their eyes. The Impressionists were all about the play of light on subjects. They focused especially on landscapes and they sought to dissolve form into color and light. Paintings were completed fairly quickly as a result. Brushstrokes were highly visible and the advent of oil paints in tubes made outdoor painting possible. Plein air painting is what it was called. In the past, the vast majority of paintings have been done in the studio. Now artists were taking their canvases out into the countryside or into the parks to paint. Claude Monet is probably the most famous of all Impressionist painters. He lived from 1840 to 1926. He's the foremost Impressionist painter. Impressionism Sunrise from 1873 is considered the first Impressionist painting. Perhaps most well known for his series paintings, however, of the countryside at Giverny, like water lilies. Here is Monet's Impression Sunrise, 1872. Here is Monet's Water Lilies from 1906. This is probably one of the most famous paintings in the world. Pierre-Auguste Renoir is another Impressionist painter. Le Ball au Moulin de la Galette from 1876 shows regular people having a good time at a dance hall. Camille Pizarro in 1877 painted Garden at Porto. This is considered by some as the true founder of Impressionism. Berth Morisot. 1841 to 1895. She is considered one of the greatest female artists of the late 19th century. She focused on scenes of domestic life and portraits of friends and family. 
Here is her The Cradle from 1872, showing a mother watching over a sleeping child. Here is Lady at Her Toilette, 1875, showing a woman getting ready, putting on her makeup, fixing her hair. Now, post-Impressionism and early 20th century art, we see a bit of a shift. Characteristics of post-Impressionism. First and foremost, they sought to know and depict worlds other than the visible world of fact. They sought to portray unseen inner worlds of emotion and imagination, like the early Romantics had. <clears throat> they sought also to express a complicated psychological view of reality, as well as an overwhelming emotional intensity, like the modern novelists. Cubism is a segment of post-impressionism that concentrated on zigzagging lines and overlapping planes. Non-representational art focused on mood rather than on objects. There was a fascination with form instead of light, like the Impressionists. Major post-Impressionists. Vincent van Gogh, a Dutch Expressionist, the, what the painting you see here as the background of our lecture is probably one of his most famous. In The Starry Night, that's this painting, 1889, he painted the vision of night as he imagined it, not as it really was. One of his most famous portraits shows him with a bandage on his ear after he allegedly cut it off. It's called self-portrait with a bandaged ear, 1889. Here is Starry Night without the words on top of it. As you can see, he also was able to portray something on a flat surface on a, in a static medium that normally you don't even see. If you look at the swirls, you see he has portrayed the wind. How do you paint the wind? I don't know, but he did it. Here is Vincent van Gogh's self-portrait with a bandaged ear. <clears throat> he did lots of self-portraits. This is just one of them. Paul Gauguin is probably one of the other most famous expressionists or post-impressionists. He pioneered expressionist techniques where he saw form and design of a painting as important in and of themselves. <clears throat> he became famous for his paintings of the South Pacific, where he spent some of his lifetime. Here we have Nave Nave Mo from 1894. He was fascinated with Tahiti and Tahitian women. He spent a great deal of time there. Here also is a Gauguin. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? 1897. Again, using the Tahitian motifs. Paul Cezanne, 1839 to 1906. He's particularly committed to form and ordered design. Later works became increasingly abstract, however, and non-representational. He also moved away from the traditional three-dimensional perspective in his art and instead embraced the two-dimensional plane. Here's Paul Cezanne's Apples and Oranges from 1899. Here's another Cezanne, The Card Players, 1890 to 92. Again, you see not as much depth perception is shown here as we've seen in earlier works of art. He embraced the two-dimensional plane. Henri Matisse, 1869 to 1954, is perhaps the most important French artist of the 20th century. The expressionism of a group of painters led by Matisse was so extreme that an exhibition of their work in Paris 
prompted shocked critics to call them la fauves or the wild beasts matisse and his followers painted real objects but their primary concern was the arrangement of color line and form as an end in itself <clears throat> henri matisse this is his the dance 1910 Pablo Picasso of Spain is another. He is perhaps the greatest artist of the 20th century. He founded Cubism in 1907. La Mademoiselle de Avignon from 1907 is considered the first Cubist masterpiece, and you can see it at the MoMA in New York City. Cubism was also known as analytical cubism and it concentrates on a complex geometry of zigzagging lines and sharply angled overlapping planes, as stated before. Picasso worked with Georges Brock in developing analytical cubism. Here is Pablo Picasso's Les Demoiselles de Avignon from 1907, one of his most famous paintings. You can see that he has broken down the human form into a series of geometric shapes and that's why it's called cubism here also is picasso's the accordionist 1911. again you see geometrical shapes making up the forms george brock compared to picasso this is the violin and the candlestick from 1910. Expressionism was another offshoot of post-impressionism. In 1910 came the ultimate stage in the development of abstract, non-representational art. Wallacey Kandinsky from 1866 to 1944. He's a Russian painter who turned away from nature completely with his non-figural paintings. Colors were used to express emotion and symbolism, but not any recognizable form. So now we're getting into the more non-traditional stuff, even more non-traditional than the cubism. This is Kandinsky's composition number seven from 1913. You see what I mean? Edvard Munch, 1863-1944, in 1893, he painted The Scream. This is one of the most famous paintings from the Expressionist period. You see anxiety in the face of the screamer. And this, of course, reflects the anxiety of the time period. 1893, the end of the 19th century, we are fast approaching the very lethal World War I that will start in 1914. 